Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tomasz Kijewski and I'm your host. We would like to uh, welcome our special guest here tonight. And together we are trying, we will try to encourage you to think about energy security uh, as something which impacts our lives, our daily lives, our energy bills, our security of our economies. Uh, so I'm an executive director at the Warsaw Institute, one of the leading think tanks in Central and Eastern Europe, focusing on geopolitics. We are proudly supporting the Free Seas Initiative and mutually beneficial transatlantic relations. So today, uh, it's a great pleasure to have a very special guest, one of the top decision makers in energy and foreign policy of the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome Ambassador Virginia Palmer. Madam Ambassador, welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, Ambassador Palmer is the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary at the Bureau for Energy Resources within the U.S. Department of State. She is a career member of the Senior Foreign Service, rank of Minister Counselor. She served as U.S. Ambassador in top destinations for a U.S. diplomat, such as South Africa, Republic of Malawi, Vietnam. Other postings during her 33-year career include assignments in Canada, China, Kenya, Hong Kong, Zimbabwe. She also has a great experience uh, in uh, counterterrorism policy in, and security uh, policy, which is important in our later uh, discussion about threats to um, critical energy infrastructure. And today we would like to talk about energy security and geopolitics of the pipelines in Central and Eastern Europe, which is of great importance, as you all know. We will mention the issue of Nord Stream 2, exports and imports of LNG, natural gas, the Free Seas Initiative as an important tool for implementation of energy projects, and also the perspectives for nuclear energy in Central and Eastern Europe. Now I would like to give the floor to Madam Ambassador for her statement about the challenges in energy security in the region of Central and Eastern Europe. Madam Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tomas. Um, good evening, everyone. It, it really is a great pleasure to be here with you. We enjoy working with the Warsaw Institute, which does great work, and it's a great opportunity for me to be able to share ideas with thought leaders and business leaders in Central and Eastern Europe, and to hear from you what you think we should be incorporating into our policy process. Um, as Tomas very nicely previewed, um, I would like to talk this evening about, first, just a little bit about global energy dynamics as we all deal with COVID, um, then talk about transatlantic energy security, and finally, Russia's role um, in European energy security. Um, I'm sorry that we're not doing this in person. Um, I've been to Warsaw and would like to come back, um, but um, I hope that everybody listening is well and that your families are well. Um, we're all needing to address the effects of COVID-19 on our national economies and on the energy use. Um, COVID has, we think, accelerated three general geopolitical trends in energy. Yeah. The, the first was using the United States relatively new energy abundance as a driver for a new cooperative relationship between producers and consumers to address the demand destruction for energy that resulted from the pandemic. Um, in response to the novel challenge, you saw this in April when oil prices uh, fell through the bottom. Um, and we looked first to the Paris-based International Energy Agency and to our European allies in the G20 to help forge a market-based solution to the demand collapse. U.S. and European energy companies responded to price signals to cut back production, and governments heeded the IEA's call to build up their strategic stocks. Another COVID-accelerated trend is the shift to renewable energy investments. Um, although co conventional energy 
demand fell pretty markedly in 2020. Renewable demand increased by 6%. And that trend is going to accelerate given how many European governments have renewables as a key element of their COVID response plans. Uh, more than a third of stimulus dollars in Europe are directed at the clean energy transition and the European Green Deal. And then finally, another trend is that we have all been made aware of the fragility of our global supply chains. The crisis provided a wake-up call for many industries, particularly clean energy, to better diversify the inputs and processes for the critical energy minerals that power electric vehicles, batteries, and solar arrays and wind turbines. As we work together on all of this, we should all keep in mind that economic growth and resilience is strengthened when women are able to access employment opportunities across all industries and sectors. This is my plug that I, I want to put in. We've made sure that all of our programs include women's role in energy. Women are very underrepresented across the sector, representing about 6% of employment in the energy sector. And, oh. and, and I think our, our, our supply chains and our energy markets will be more secure with greater and more diverse participation. Um, and then the reason that I asked to come and speak um, at the Warsaw Institute was because I, I think that a lot of the headlines focus on the negative, but in fact there is a very good story to tell about European energy security and diversification. Um, the United States and Europe are working more closely than ever on the supply chain issue from clean tech to clean energy and we're facing shared challenges together. We believe Europe is more energy secure now than it was 10 years ago or even five years ago because of the diversification of energy types, sources, and routes. You can't diversify only one of those things. Having all three and diversity across all of those gives you real yeah. choice, real optionality, and then real leverage over price, which is very important. As Tomas said at the top, that's how ordinary citizens in all of our countries perceive energy security. Do I have reliable access to affordable energy? Um, am I alarmed when I open my fuel bill each month? Developments like the Baltic Pipe and Southern Gas Corridor, a key portion of which the TAP pipeline were just completed, uh, floating storage and regasification units in Greece, Croatia, and Lithuania, and new connectors like the IGB, and of course new renewables and nuclear energy options mean that Europeans have more choices about their energy mix and better energy prices. Um, the I mentioned the IEA, the, the executive director of the IEA, Fahi Burrell, told um, Reuters last year that because of the big challenge from LNG and better rec regulation, there was a lot of renegotiation of prices and, and prices came down as a result. I think that's, that's particularly important. Um, I, I want to mention um, that the United States has a whole of government approach across the State Department, USAID, the Department of Energy, the Department of Commerce, and our new Development Finance Corporation um, to make U.S. energy products, technologies, and services available in European energy markets. Um, however, it's not all about the sale of U.S. products. These were issues that the United States was interested in before we were an energy exporter. And um, those commitments remain strong and will rem remain strong um, with, with any new, new government. Um, I want to reassure um, the listeners tonight that um, there is strong bipartisan support for all of these energy security initiatives. European energy security requires a broad-based European and U.S. focus to diversify energy sources, liberalize markets, and enable smooth transitions to clean energy. I know this is near and dear to the hearts of our, our European friends. Um, it's also very important to Americans. Our commitment begins at the highest level of our governments, as seen with the Three Seas Initiative, whose summit occurred just last month. It's a top priority of the State Department where I work. The Three Seas Initiative, first launched by the presidents of Poland and Croatia in 2015, is another example of where Poland is working with its neighbors to create a stronger, more interconnected Central and Eastern European region. Secretary Pompeo announced in February of this year that U.S. support through that new Development Finance Institute Corporation that I mentioned um, will provide up to a billion dollars in financing toward the Three Seas Initiatives for infrastructure projects. 
Secretary Pompeo reaffirmed U.S. support for the Three Seas Initiative in a virtual summit just last month. And he stated that the Three Seas Initiative matters much more than it would have even five or 10 years ago. That's why it's imperative that projects under the Three Seas Initiative's energy pillar move forward quickly so that we can also stimulate post-COVID economic recovery and jobs. Progress toward real supply diversity remains an important component of our work in Europe. It includes breaking unfairly subsidized monopolies by making significant progress on nuclear energy and fuel supply projects with Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, Slovenia, and U Ukraine, with others to follow, we hope. And uh, I should just mention um, a little bit about U.S.-Poland um, cooperation, because Poland has been a strong yes, sure. ally in talking about these European energy security issues and um, has have been acting um, across the board to ensure Poland's energy security, but also the energy security of the region. That's right. <clears throat> We, um, now I'm going to stumble, Tomas, but the, the Swin Owiszcze um, LNG terminal was a major yeah. step for Poland and the region to secure gas from new markets. Baltic Pipe, which I mentioned already, will eventually connect Poland to Norway's gas fields via Denmark, and that's another great example. Both the LNG terminal and Baltic Pipe represent two key pillars of a good energy security strategy, one that diversifies suppliers and routes of energy resources. Poland has also been a key partner with Baltic states in their efforts to diversify suppliers of energy, such as through the construction of the gas interconnector Poland-Lithuania, or GIPAL, a pipeline that will ensure bi-directional gas flows between Poland and Lithuania. Poland is also cooperating with the Baltic states as they work to synchronize the Baltic electricity networks with the continental Europe power grid following the Baltic states' desynchronization from the Moscow-controlled electricity network. And finally, Poland has been a steadfast opponent of Nord Stream 2, a project designed to undermine, not strengthen, Europe's energy security. And I can talk about that later if you like. Um, okay. Let's talk about Russia now, um, or more specifically, the Kremlin and the, its political leverage over energy export monopolies. European over-reliance on Russian energy monopolies under the control of the Kremlin creates serious strategic vulnerabilities. And here, Poland was an early recognizer of this fact. Russia uses its strong market position to exert political and economic leverage on European governments through European energy consumers. And the strongest examples of this were when supplies of gas through Ukraine were cut off in 2006 and 2009. Nord Stream 2 and the second line of Turk Stream are Russian export pipeline projects being built for the explicit purpose of allowing Russia to cut off or significantly reduce Russian gas transit through Ukraine and destabilize Ukraine. Um, I, I think this is um, terrifically um, in, important to, to recognize. Um, the capacity probably isn't necessary um, and um, is, is really set up for geopolitical purposes rather than economic purposes. Yeah. Um, I, I'd also like to address before I close um, some misinformation about the United States being interested in, in halting construction of those pipelines, not for reasons or concerns about European energy security, but because we want to sell LNG. And again, our opposition to those pipelines um, is much more longstanding than our export of, of resources. Um, but yeah. The, the U.S. exports of LNG give European countries more options um, that help reduce the prices that they will pay um, for, for supply. Um, I'd also like to address, if I may, some misinformation that has come out about the cleanliness of U.S. gas. Um, U.S. gas is at least as clean as Russian gas. Um, and um, we have data from lots of different international organizations that confirm that our emissions are lower and flaring is less intense in the production of U.S. gas than for Russian gas. Um, the United States agrees with the world that we must significantly reduce methane emissions in the natural gas life cycle, and U.S. firms are industry leaders in doing just that. And that's why U.S. natural gas production, which grew over 60% from 2000 to 2018, while methane emissions from the energy sector declined more than 20%. So we're being very attentive to that. Um, we want to work with 
our partners and European allies to ensure transparent and open energy markets that level the playing field for U.S. products and services. And we want to build our resilience to economic pressure and coercion from, from powers like Russia. Um, this isn't in any way an anti-Russian stance. Um, we simply want Russia to play by market rules and act as a real actor in the energy market, um, yes. not to use power as a, as a political exactly. lever over our friends in Europe. So we, we stand ready to work with you and look forward to hearing your ideas about how we can do that better. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Ambassador. And now we will proceed to a series of, of questions. Let me start with a short introduction to each of them. Uh, you touched many important subjects, uh, Madam Ambassador, uh, so let me just focus on, on some of the uh, details. Uh, so for many years, as you know, Poland and other countries in Central and Eastern Europe uh, were dependent for, from one source supply of natural gas, of course, from the Eastern uh, direction. Now, the kind of revolution on the natural gas market is going on with the rapid developments of LNG capacities and uh, building uh, new interconnectors of natural gas in the region. And the American side is active uh, in Central and Eastern Europe region. We do hope that you will uh, continue supporting the diversification of natural gas in our region. And my question, Madam Ambassador, is, how will the new U.S. administration approach this energy security in Europe, and especially in our Eastern and center, uh, Central Europe? Will opposition to the Nord Stream 2 pipeline remain a priority as part of U.S. policy? Um, thanks, Tomas. These are, these are questions that are bouncing all around Washington as well. Um, we, we don't yet have a new administration, so I, I can't speak for them, but um, I, I remain very confident that there is bipartisan support for opposition to um, Nord Stream 2 and the second pipe for, for Turk Stream 2. Um, and again, these are based on national security rather than simply economic concerns that we have. We want our European friends to have access to a ver diverse range of, of energy. Um, and we want that to be available at the best prices possible for you. Um, and we, we don't believe that Nord Stream 2 um, provides any of those things. Um, so we are continuing to reach out to companies to warn them of the sanctions risk. Uh, I think it's important to, to note that we don't want to sanction anybody, um, but we want to make sure that people understand that they, they will risk um, United States sanctions if they continue with pipeline for, for Nord Stream 2. I, um, I also think that the U.S. government has promoted efforts to divor diversify all forms of energy, um, and that will certainly continue into the next administration. We're looking particularly at energy sources that will support Europe's energy transition um, to clean energy, and gas is, as we've talked about in these pipelines and LNG, is an important transition fuel for that transition to clean energy. It's very important for base load, um, for price stabilization, and for rapid transition to, to clean energy technology. That's right. Thank you very much. And uh, now we, there is a vivid public debate in Europe about energy diversification and the US is supporting energy security uh, in our part of Europe. Of course, US companies would like to earn uh, treating this as a commercial project. But what is more important for us in Central and Eastern Europe is the fact that we can count on stable and fair source of supply at the reasonable, affordable prices, right? So bearing this in mind, that increasing American interest in energy issues in Europe is a fact, will the U.S. be interested in supporting the development of natural gas infrastructure between countries in CEE, like natural gas interconnectors or new projects such as Baltic pipe uh, between Poland and Denmark? And will the U.S. consider the expansion of LNG capacity in this region even further? 
Great. I, I think, Tomas, the answer to that is yes. Uh, the U.S. government has long supported and promoted energy infrastructure projects that ensure diversification of supply and routes, as, as we've ta been talking about. Um, it's been a tenet of our transatlantic policy across administration and enjoys the support of both Democrats and Republicans. Um, just a point of clarification, we don't see the Baltic Pipe as a new project. Um, we've been supportive of the project for many years. Um, and I think it's also evidence of the fact that um, it's not, we, we don't care about these issues simply as a means to sell U.S. gas to Europe. Uh, the Baltic Pipe ensures that Norwegian gas can reach Poland um, via Denmark or maybe Poland and beyond. It's another prong in Poland and the Central and Eastern European region's efforts to diversify its gas supplies. Um, our support for the Baltic Pipe is one of the many examples of of, again, our support for European energy diversification. Yes. Thank you very much, Madam Ambassador. And now uh, let's uh, move to the Free Seas initiative. Uh, and when this initiative was launched, of course, it was uh, during, it happened during the presidency of Donald Trump. But Joe Biden's foreign policy advisor, Michael Carpenter, said that this initiative can be a counterweight for the to the Chinese project of One Belt, One Road. Mm. So the Free Seas Initiative strongly supports developing of natural gas interconnections and LNG capabilities. Considering the above, does the US want to take active part in building this energy dimension of the Free Seas Initiative? Um, again, the answer to that is a resounding yes. Um, we've long been a partner of the Three Seas Initiatives, and we see that as a mechanism to develop a more energy secure Central and Eastern European region. Um, and I'll, I'll just, I, I think I said at the top, but I will repeat for emphasis that um, in February, Secretary Pompeo announced that the DFC would make a billion dollars available for infrastructure yes. projects in the Three Seas Initiative. And we see the energy dimension, like the transportation and digital sort of pillars of, of infrastructure projects as a key component of the Three Seas Initiative. Um, and again, an integrated European energy market or a central and Eastern European energy market is a more secure um, energy market. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Ambassador. I'm glad that you, uh, you know, underlined this, this important part and, and project for us. And we are, we are looking forward to U.S. Uh, involvement, uh, of course. So uh, we currently observe an increase in asymmetric threats, not only to the natural gas pipelines infrastructure, but also to power networks like electricity grids. The U.S. has experience, as we know, in protecting critical infrastructure against asymmetric attacks, including hacker attacks. So my question is, could the U.S. consider supporting its partners, allies, in developing such security systems for natural gas and nuclear energy? Thanks. That, that's a very good and um, complicated question. Um, I, I think digitalization in the power sector, as you mentioned, um, continues to grow in prominence and um, globally since 2014, global investment in digital electricity infrastructure has grown by an impressive 20% each year. Um, and smart cities are an incredibly important aspect of energy efficiency and that new growth of electricity as a key element of energy security. So power supply is something that the IEA is increasingly looking at as an element of energy security. However, um, increased energy system digitalization can also face more complex cybersecurity challenges, as you mentioned. And many cyber threat groups engage in data theft and exploit vulnerabilities in the energy sector for financial or political gain. And the State Department has been very active in the last few years in warning our friends um, to be aware of what technologies they're relying on or building into their grids to make sure that they're not adding additional vulnerabilities as they seek energy efficiency yeah. and digitalization. Yeah, um, I'd like to provide an example from ASEAN about how the U.S. is supporting our allies. Um, we have an 
an ASEAN digitalization program, it's called, which will build the capacity of local stakeholders to assess the needs and develop strategy for energy digitalization development using integrated energy planning tools and models. And the work applies to all energy sources across the energy value train. So looking at gas as a you know baseline um, and then the yes. smart cities and digitalization that I referred to. The goal is to improve electricity sector operations and cybersecurity so that countries are better able to integrate market-driven energy sources into their, their energy mix. And then additionally, at the subnational level, two or three cities will be selected for pilot projects and the United States will provide them with analytical tools and approaches to help them plan smart city elements and harmonize with national level best practices. The training will focus on smart grid modeling and integration tools to improve cybersecurity. Um, ultimately, these pilot cities will be expected to share best practices across the ASEAN smart cities network. Um, there may be opportunities for such partnerships between, you know, subnational levels in Poland and the United States or across Central Europe. I'm sure the United States has a lot to learn from our European partners as well. Um, and we, we all of us, are, I think, are, need to work together to address these new and emerging challenges, um, particularly cybersecurity. Yes. I agree. And, you know, NATO, uh, cyber cybersecurity units also have, have its role in this process, I believe. Thank you very much, Madam Ambassador. And now you mentioned uh, earlier that uh, natural gas can be a transition fuel towards green economy. And of course, it's, uh, uh, it's un understandable. But also, we could see that nuclear energy might be also uh, some kind of support in this regard. We know that China, France and Russia are active in Europe, promoting their offer to build or finance nuclear power plants. But we also know that the US is considering expansion in, and sharing its civil nuclear technology offer to selected countries in Europe. So do you think, Madam Ambassador, that the US might consider in the future the possibility of transferring civil nuclear technologies to other countries in Europe, especially in our region, Central and Eastern Europe? Can the US be interested uh, in sharing this technology on a commercial basis? and extend it to other countries, and not only to Poland, which, as we know, will probably happen soon. Um, absolutely. We're, we're enthusiastic about that. Um, and in fact, the, the Development Finance Corporation, which is still a new tool in, in sort of our policy arsenal, um, has just been given permission, essentially, by our Congress to, to finance nuclear projects. Um, which is an, a new development and, and a very welcome one. Um, the United States would like to regain its lead um, in the export of nuclear technology. Our, our technology is, is some of the best in the world. Um, there is new advanced nuclear technology and small modular reactors, which will have new applications globally. And we're really excited about that. Um, U.S. Firm, firms are at the forefront of this. And um, we want to make sure that our, our friends have options that are not associated with malign actors, um, both because the technology is less good and because there are debt traps and, and other sort of perils in, in dealing with that technology. Um, you mentioned Poland, but we can point to recent progress on potentially very significant nuclear energy and fuel supply projects across Europe, um, including Poland, of course, Romania, Bulgaria, Slovenia, and Ukraine. Um, and those are examples of clear bilateral nuclear energy cooperation success stories yes. for U.S. nuclear vendors and our European allies. Um, and again, we, we, the United States government doesn't operate in the same way that the Chinese government or even the French government do to support our companies. Um, but um, we hope we have some new tools to, to help our companies and we believe their technology is really exciting. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Ambassador. It's, it's a good uh, statement. Uh, so the, let me proceed to the last question in this series. Uh, the world is not only grappling with COVID, but also with energy transformations across different sectors. The EU, in particular, recently announced its European Green Deal and also must manage increased diversification of energy resources. 
and supplies. How are you engaging with European allies, Madam Ambassador, uh, and partners on this? That's an interesting question. Um, indeed, we recognize how passionate our European friends are about the European Green Deal and about the transition to clean energy technologies. And um, we, contrary to opposing it, we would we 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 would like to engage and we are engaging with the EU to see how American companies can participate in that and how American energy can help um, supply um, that transition. Um, we hope that all forms of energy will be considered. We, you and I have talked about gas um, quite a bit as being an important transition fuel. Um, nuclear energy, as we've also discussed, will, will also be a very important clean fuel. Um, and the United States and U.S. firms are ready, willing, and able to support European efforts to ship, shift from coal to um, natural gas and, and other technologies. Um, I'd like to return to something I mentioned briefly at the top. Um, there's some misinformation. It's kind of topical right now. Um, I think it's propagated by Europe's leading supplier of gas that that to assert that U.S. natural gas is um, not as clean as others. Um, and we've been working with the EU and, in fact, have meetings later this week to see if we can arrive at a common standard for the measurement of methane emissions. Um, so that when we're talking about the sale of gas and everybody's trying to have as clean um, an energy mix as they can, that we're comparing apples and apples, not apples and beef cattle. Um, we. Um, as I mentioned, the U.S. natural gas production grew more than 60 percent um, in the 10, 20 years between 2000 and 2018, and yet our emissions went down by 20 percent. And then the World Bank and the IEA reports that methane emissions intensity, which is the measure of how much methane is released per cubic meter of gas produced, is much lower in the United States than in Russia and many other major gas suppliers to Europe. Um, U.S. gas is actually cleaner than many of Europe's primary suppliers, including Russia. Um, Russia's methane intensity is 53 um, and 23 percent greater. Um, the IEA says 53 percent and the UNFCCC says 23 percent greater than gas produced in the United States. And I think that's an important calculus as Europe seeks to um, define its sort of carbon tax and um and and green its energy mix yeah i think it's a very good point madam ambassador i remember the the discussion about shale gas uh, uh, in europe a few years ago and the same arguments uh, were raised uh, which is which is uh, you know very funny but uh, but it's it was uh, yes <laughs> Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Madam Ambassador, for your thoughts. And now I would like to ask a few questions we have received. So the first one, uh, uh, it's a series of questions combined, uh, combined. So please offer your views on energy exports. How do you address LNG exports in your engagements with counterparts, especially with European countries? How does the US policy on uh, energy exports fit within the broader diplomatic strategy of the United States towards Europe. And please also discuss your work on European energy security, reduced reliance on Russian gas, and how you see US LNG as part of that picture. Okay, thanks. Um, I, US LNG is certainly a part of that picture in that it's a clean affordable fuel available to our European friends and more and more so with the addition of FSRUs and land-based um, terminals to accept that gas. Um, and again, optionality reduces prices. Um, Lithuania went and built the independence, for example, and um, even though they still buy much of their gas from Russia. Having the FSRU available to Lithuania meant that they were able to uh, negotiate a better price with Gazprom. So I think that sort of diversity um, requirement and of supply and route uh, applies a, across all elements of, of your question. Um, I, I'll give you kind of a 
a numbers laden answer, if I may. Um, I think we need to consider some very sobering statistics um, for Europe. Uh, Europe's single largest energy supplier is Russia, with about 30% of EU crude oil imports coming from Russia and almost 40% of your natural gas um, imports coming from Russia. Many European countries rely on Russian gas for over 75% of their supply. And as a point of contrast, consider that Europe's gas imports from North America are only 2% of Europe's total supply. So there's a lot of room for growth in there. Um, and that that's even with a 272% in US LNG exports to Europe um, since 2018. Um, we had hoped that, that that upward trend would continue. We've been interrupted by COVID-19 and we need to see kind of where, where markets rebalance um, as, as we emerge from the pandemic next year. Um, our longstanding policy and one that predates the United States emergence as a major exporter of oil and gas is to support our European partners energy and broader security interest built on diversification of energy suppliers routes and fuel types and that includes nuclear and renewables um, and I'll stress again as I mentioned earlier that this isn't in any way um, to oppose Russia or to object to Europe being an important energy partner of Europe. It's only to say that if, if you are dependent on Russian monopolies, they have demonstrated that they are willing to use that leverage for political purposes. Um, and that having more optionality of price, uh, excuse me, of, of supply and route um, gives you better prices. Um, the IEA recently estimated that the market impact of greater U.S. LNG availability, even though it's very small as a relative market share, saved Europe $8 billion in 2018 alone. Um, in fact, U.S. LNG exports to Europe hit their highest mark last year, as I mentioned, and we're, we're hoping that that sort of upward trend will, will continue once we emerge from the pandemic. Um, we hope that Russia can and should remain part of a diversified energy mix for Europe, but we'd like to see Russian producers abide by the same rules as other open market players. And we're working to create the conditions where Russia no longer uses its energy resources as a political weapon or engages in other malign behavior. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Ambassador. And the next question uh, is, uh, the last one is about COVID-19 pandemic, yes. So how has the COVID-19 pandemic impacted your work and U.S. energy policy initiatives? Well, um, well I, I think everybody listening has been impacted, you know, one way or another. We don't, we'd like to be doing this in person um, and, and we're not able to have some of the side conversations that we might have over a cup of coffee at the, at the beginning or the end of of a meeting like this. Um, but I, I think that our the tempo of our work really hasn't changed very much, nor the direction of it. We, we all must be prepared for recovery from the pandemic for the sort of resurgence of demand. And I think that European governments are seizing the opportunity of the stimulus packages available to shape the kind of green energy economies they'd like to have. Um, one thing that um, we've been working on is is acknowledging that new shifts to clean energy technologies will increase our demand for energy minerals this isn't something we talk about a lot um we when we think about needing new battery technologies for example for storage or um or lithium for for batteries um new minerals that are required for wind turbines or solar photovoltaic panels. Um, that demand is increasing markedly. And the market concentration for those minerals is also higher than for oil and gas. Um, and so we need to pay particular attention to the supply chain for those minerals, which is dominated by a single country. So we're working to ensure that there um, is greater attention to that from the market um, and also that there are tools available for countries that have those minerals that would like to develop them in a more sustainable and responsible way. So we have something called the Energy Resources Governance Initiative, which will provide assistance to governments. And sorry, I should mention it's not just the United States. We're in partnership with Peru, 
Botswana, Canada, and Australia, and welcome participation from any other country that would like to be involved okay, that to provide capacity building assistance to countries with mines or which would like to develop processing and separation um, plants to um, to be able to develop those things responsibly. Um, so we provide assistance in regulation, um, understanding the market, understanding sort of the geology available so that those minerals will be available and they won't be price volatility um, as we move to clean energy technologies. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Ambassador, for your very uh, good opinions on this. And well, time is running out on us. So uh, dear online guests, uh, let me conclude and make a few observations. Uh, it is in the best interest of both Poland and countries in Central and Eastern Europe to continue our efforts towards energy security. We have adequate tools now to do this with liquefied natural gas uh, technology and building uh, our network of interconnectors. Uh, we count on the US support in this field, of course, and particularly when it comes to the Free Seas Initiative and its energy arm. Moreover, we are looking for perspectives for increasing cooperation with US on nuclear energy, safe and stable fuel for transition to green economy. Uh, other part of our cooperation uh, perspective is about a critical energy infrastructure and protection it, uh, which is crucial for, for sustainable uh, energy supply. And we can also cooperate in the area of uh, diminishing the negative impacts of COVID-19 on energy markets. So thank you very much, Madam Ambassador, for uh, your presence here. It was my honor to, to host this meeting. Uh, for us at Warsaw Institute, uh, we, it is crucial to support uh, our transatlantic ties by strengthening this public debate and uh, raising society awareness about issues, uh, energy issues and potential for cooperation with US on this in Central and Eastern Europe. Dear viewers, thank you very much for your attention and please join us again. I recommend to you our website, Warsaw Institute. You can find a lot of uh, up-to-date, uh, excellent reports and analysis uh, related to key issues shaping Europe's uh, Central and Eastern Europe's uh, security landscape. And here I would like to also thank uh, very much my uh, great team at the Warsaw Institute especially Maciek, Jędrzej and Chris and other great teammates for making possible of, of this uh, meeting today. So once again, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Ambassador. And thank you very much, dear guests. Th thank you, Tomas. Look forward to working with you. Thank you very much.